Good afternoon, everyone. We are right at 1231. And so we are going to get started. I want to welcome each of you to today's Lunch and Learn. For those of you who I don't know, I'm Sandra Howe, the Vice President of Talent Innovation at the Greater Memphis Chamber. Before we get started, I would like to recognize a few people. First, Queen Tatile Kaskesa, who is our Talent Innovation Specialist, is the person who actually organized today's event. So we wanna say thank you to Queen um, for her diligence in this work. Also would like to thank Tunja Lee and Patricia McKinney who um, supported Queen behind the scenes to make today's event a reality. Also, if there are any other of our chamber staff members who are on the line on the webinar, I wanna thank you all for your support today as well as any of our upscale champions who are joining us today, our upscale 901 talent initiative champions. We are extremely honored to host today's session. We hear so much about equity and inclusion and how it's important for businesses to understand the workforce. Well, Pfizer is not only talking about it, they have created a best practice. Pfizer's Refugee Talent Initiative has set out the goal of hiring at least 150 refugees in 2022 alone. Before I introduce our panelists and we officially kick off the webinar, I'd like to ask our Senior VP of Workforce Development, Amity Schuyler, to help set the context as to why equity, inclusion, and access is critically important to the work that we're doing and to our workforce ecosystem. Amity? Thank you, Sandra, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited that you were able to set aside some time in your schedule today um, to participate in this Lunch and Learn. I feel like I would be preaching to the choir if we really started to provide real deep context of why these initiatives are important, but we all share a vision for prosperity for all. And in order to make that vision a reality, we have got to create intentionally the systemic pathways that allows for access to that. Um, I'm gonna do something a little different today. And before we get started, I want everybody to think about how your day started this morning from the time your feet hit the ground. Just think about your morning routine and your morning rituals of what happens when your feet hit the ground from the time you come out of bed. Did you take your dog for a walk? which is what we do because our dog has an internal alarm clock of 4 30 a.m did you make a pot of coffee did you spend time in a devotional or did you turn on the news or espn did you text your adult children or your grandchildren just to let them know that you love them and to have a good day or that you'll see them tonight for dinner did you iron your clothes do a quick load of laundry maybe take something out of the freezer for dinner tonight. Just think about how your morning starts every morning. We have those routines and rituals. Now I want you to rewind those moments this morning and imagine that from the time your feet hit the floor this morning, you had that 12 hours or less to gather what you could carry, leave your job, your home, everything you've ever known with almost 100% certainty you were never returning. Imagine the feeling of knowing that in 36 hours or less, your entire life as you know it would be turned inside out, upside down, and completely left in the hands of strangers. We are seeing these moments, as you know, play out in front of us every day on prime time, whether it was Afghan refugees fleeing a country, whether it's the, the, the horrible atrocity occurring right now, um, it, it, it's real and we see it on CNN, on NBC, um, and we risk being desensitized to it because we are so getting so accustomed to seeing it. But we have a wonderful opportunity in the private sector to be part of the solution. We have an incredible opportunity uh, and a role to play in helping refugees integrate economically and socially into their new lives, um, and particularly in a community like Memphis. And as a chamber, we believe that these organizations and our community will be better for it. And that's why our refugee and immigrant engagement is an important part of our workforce development strategy. It's an important 
component of our diversity or equity and inclusion initiatives. And I know that you all believe it's important or you would not have set aside the time today for this lunch and learn. With us today is the team from Pfizer. They're doing incredibly impactful, meaningful work and they're doing it on scale. And they graciously agreed to share their experiences with their refugee talent initiative. And we're hoping that this is just the beginning of many rich, intentional, actionable conversations for our region and particularly for our city. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Sandra, who's gonna kick us off with introductions of the Pfizer team and get us into our conversations. I also want to echo a special thank you to Queen, who has been so passionate about this conversation. Um, she has her own personal story to share. I don't know that we'll get to it today, but I'm hoping that if you haven't heard it, that we'll be able to share it um, in a similar environment in the near future. So with that, Ms. Howell, I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Amity. And so I am actually, um, I'm hoping that I don't mispronounce our speakers' names. I'm not gonna, you know, we can talk about this issue um, for days on end because we at the chamber are so passionate about equity and inclusion. And again, thankful to Queen for leading this effort for us. Um, but I do want to give enough time for our panelists who again are doing an incredible job in this space. And so I'm going to ask that our panelists um, actually introduce yourselves. And in doing so, if you don't mind giving us your title um, and what your role is um, at Pfizer and in this program. And um, Medina, if we can start with you, that'd be great. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nidina Niazi. I just want to say it's a pleasure to be here and share what Pfizer and our team has been up to. Um, I've been here at Pfizer for the last four years, and it's been a wonderful experience so far. As of late, I've been prouder than ever to say that I work at Pfizer, aside from the work that we're doing with our pharmaceutical therapies, we're also creating space for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and making sure that we do our part. Uh, and specifically over the last six months, I've had the honor to work very closely with Pfizer's Refugee Leadership Initiative team as uh, its program manager. Uh, and I'll definitely share more about the initiative, but just very briefly, the initiative um, is committed to recognizing refugee talent and creating colleague opportunities for that talent here at Pfizer. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it over to Ali Morrison. Um, so take it away. Oh, Ali, I think you're on mute. Thanks, Nagina. I appreciate the introduction. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to join all of you today um, to share a little bit more about the work that Pfizer is doing. So again, my name is Ali Morrison, and I am the People Experience Lead for our two U.S. logistics centers, Memphis and Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. I've been with Pfizer about three years now, and I will let Raheel introduce herself next. Hi everybody, my name is Raheel and I just joined Pfizer about a month and a half ago. I am the refugee talent recruiter. And uh, just like um, Amity mentioned earlier, uh, she mentioned a lot of these people actually had a matter of a few hours uh, to pack their bags. A lot of the refugees, I'm actually speaking with them directly. So I actually hear their stories. Uh, a lot of them, they, they don't even have their the proper documents. If they're doctors, they don't have the medical certificates. So we are, um, it's an honor to be here. And I am, uh, I've been working very closely with uh, our refugee candidates. Awesome. Thank you, ladies, so much for introducing yourselves. And now I'm going to turn the table over to you all and allow you to do your thing. Thank you so much again for being here. Sure. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, we've just got a quick deck, talk a little bit about the program, uh, how it came to fruition, and uh, where we are currently. And then um, Ali, as our Memphis site lead will speak more to the specific benefits and opportunities uh, available to our talent at that site. And then uh, for he can talk more about the recruitment process as well. So um, I do ask that, you know, you think of questions as I, as I go through this, uh, we're really excited to talk to you guys and share, share our progress so far. Um, 
So I want to start with uh, providing some background on the refugee crisis itself. As some of you may be aware, um, Afghanistan's fall to the Taliban in August of 2021 um, initiated for the US government and other countries around the world, uh, as well as private groups to airlift approximately 124,000 individuals out of Afghanistan. 85% of those individuals were Afghans and 65,000 of that 85% arrived in the US. Uh, upon their arrival, the US government is responsible for screening, vetting, and processing the refugee population, as well as working with the refugee resettlement agencies to help those Afghans integrate into American society by finding them homes, registering their children in schools, and also helping them obtain employment to sustain beyond the temporary support that they're receiving from the government. As of January 6th, 55,000 Afghans had been resettled across the country and around, I want to say around 5,000 still remain at domestic military bases. The last time we had gone to the base, we received a number of um, different estimates of how many people they had on base. So it was difficult to get an exact, um, but this population that has been resettled doesn't include the additional 125,000 refugees that the Biden administration has already committed to admitting throughout 2022. Um, and there is going to be an expectation that 30,000 of those refugees will be Afghan. Furthermore, with what's happening in the Ukraine right now and in Russia, um, there is an expectation that there will be a number of Ukrainian and Russian refugees coming as well. Um, so our, our leadership has been extremely supportive and um, has really backed this initiative. Our CEO, Albert, he uh, himself is an immigrant and Payal, who is our chief human resources officer, she was an Afghan refugee herself. And so with their immense support, the Refugee Talent Initiative evolved from merely an idea um, to a full-blown program, which Pfizer is now fully committed to. We've partnered with companies like Tent, Accenture, Manpower, and many more, uh, including, the, including the organization of the Memphis uh, Chamber of Commerce to support our initiative. Uh, Tent has been extremely helpful in connecting us with non-governmental organizations, which are local to our manufacturing sites. And through those non-governmental organizations, we've been able to connect with refugee talent apart from the talent that we've been actively identifying um, at the military bases. So uh, I do want to share um, a PDF of this slide after and uh, Queen and Sandra, I should have asked before this, but I do hope that I'm able to send you guys like a PDF of the deck so you can share it with the audience uh, later on if they do want to come back and refer to it. But these are just some pictures of um, our company in action and what we have been up to when it comes to supporting the initiative. Um, so there's some images of us meeting with some of our senior leaders, uh, some of our team at the refugee base camps, um, donations that our colleagues have put together and um, funded to trying to help the refugee community coming in as well. Um, so I do hope you guys can uh, have a closer look at those images as well. Um, so our first hire was uh, was a pretty big deal because you know it was just confirming that this is happening and that we're doing this um, and that we are fully committed. So our first hire was Asal of Sali. And um, he was a very high profile Afghan refugee who, when he was in Afghanistan, he had very high level roles and was extremely skilled. And so we wanted to make sure that we were matching him to a role that matched to his profile. Um, what we have found is that a lot of the refugees coming in, they are highly skilled and have high profiles, but because of the fact that they're um, so desperate and concerned that they may not be placed to a job. They have been either removing credentials from their resumes or um, trying to avoid seeming overqualified. And so here at Pfizer, what we're doing is making sure that not only do we have mentoring in place to help those refugees with their, um, with their resumes and with the training, and Rahil has been doing an amazing job uh, kind of guiding them and taking on that course of action and making sure that they're ready for those interviews. Um, but we've also been making sure that we find them roles where it is able to empower them as well as us, um, because that's talent that we want to make sure we're leveraging and not just putting to the side. 
So the program itself is international, um, but I will be speaking more to our US program uh, for today's session. Uh, of course, if you guys do have any questions, we will answer them as best as we can and follow up afterwards if there's anything we can't answer. Um, but in terms of where we are currently, we do have 15 out of our commitment of 100 refugees hired. Um, and there are currently interviews happening, start dates being offered, um, and uh, other offers being given out as well. So that number is expected to increase shortly. And then for our mentors, we have 40 out of 150 so far. So I mentioned earlier that our team has made visits to the Fort Dix military base. Um, I personally have visited four times, but our team has been there a total of five. Every time we've gone, it's been, it was a very extremely emotional experience. Um, the first time specifically will like stand out to me the most forever just because of how desperate everybody was. And it was, it was very shortly after they had been resettled into the Fort Dix base camp. So the uncertainty was there and um, I was there as a translator, but of course, uh, when people can recognize that you have that common ground with them, they find that sense of comfort. And so everybody was like racing over to me, trying to ask me questions. And at one point, uh, the security guard actually like lifted me and like put me behind a table and I was like, you can't be doing that. Um, but needless to say, I was with uh, two of my other team members and we were all doing our best to speak to every single person that came up to our table to ask questions, um, trying to give them more as much information as we could in terms of where Pfizer was located, what Pfizer does, and how we were willing to help. Um, and so it is very, very fulfilling to see how far we've come so far. And Rahil, I know you were there for the last time that we had our session. If you want to speak a little bit about that, feel free. I think you may be on mute, I'm sorry. Rahil, you're still on mute. Sorry, can everybody hear me? <laughs> yes. Um, so I was actually there about five weeks ago. I've only been to the military base once and we've been successfully able to place two people um, out of uh, that visit. Um, we have, I think we, uh, we, lo we uh, spoke to about maybe a little bit over 100 people. At the time, this was towards the end of our visit. Um, there was only a couple of thousand people left, 2,000, I believe, at the military base. So out of that 100 people that we spoke with, I was able to place two of them. And uh, we are still pending. There's a few more um, uh, interviews that are still pending. So I'm hoping to place more of them. Uh, so in terms of what Pfizer is doing to push forward our um, promise to be equitable. We are trying to consider the position to be remote for a period of up to two years. So uh, for our first hire, for example, um, he had resettled into Dallas and the role that he was going into was currently remote, but there was potential that it would go back into the office. Um, unfortunately, the role itself was based out of Tampa. We did work with the hiring manager and explain the situation and how it is very crucial and critical for him to, for the new hire uh, of Saul to be based out of Dallas and to be close to his family and focus on resettling his family. And so they agreed to allow him to stay there for up to two years. And the plan is for him to grow throughout the company and throughout the organization so that by then he will have other opportunities he can pursue and hopefully uh, continue to stay in Dallas. In terms of our, ro our roles that are in our manufacturing sites, we are offering upfront bonuses to support resettlement as well. Um, and we are offering local transportation and carpool options to and from the talent's home. So uh, we are looking for services where we can pick them up from their home drop them off at the site and then pick them up from the site and drop them off back home after their day is done. All of that will be free of charge uh, from in terms of any costs coming from the 
candidate or the colleague, there will be none. Um, and these benefits I'm going over are benefits on top of our uh, existing colleague benefits. These are benefits that we're creating specifically for our um, refugee population to make sure that we are enabling them to um, be as successful as they can in their careers as we hire. And Ali, if you want to speak more uh, to this piece as well, because I know every site is different when it comes to our cohort hiring process and as well as the roles that we'll be offering as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd love to talk a little bit more specifically about what we're doing in Memphis. And actually the timing could not be better um, because today we have uh, five refugee candidates visiting our site. Uh, I believe they just left. So I was actually chatting a little bit with the managers um, to understand how it went. Um, so our goal at this time in Memphis is to hire five colleagues as a cohort. Um, our business in Memphis is one of our distribution centers. So it's warehouse type work, um, which will allow colleagues who may not have um, entirely fluent English skills yet um, to adapt. So we'll be working on what's needed in terms of translations. Um, and also working to provide this level of flexibility that Nagina um, mentioned. So one of the really exciting things about this program is Pfizer is such a large company and we're, we're moving quickly and we're learning from each other. So just earlier today, I was actually on a call with all of our um, people experience, formerly HR leads, um, who are all kind of in different places in the U.S. and different places in the refugee hiring process. So we were sharing things that we've seen work well, um, resources that we have, trying to figure out how to make this a really positive experience for our refugee candidates. Um, so we're very hopeful um, that initially the cohort of five that was able to come on site uh, today will be potentially our first hires into the program uh, in the Memphis area. And looking forward to potentially uh, growing that as we uh, continue to partner with some of the local organizations. So huge thank you to Queen again um, for her support and um, just uh, making some connections for us. Um, so I will go ahead and hand it over to Raheel if you have anything else from maybe a recruitment standpoint that you want to touch on before we get into questions. Um, as of right now, I can't think of anything. You, you did a great job covering Memphis. I'm excited to actually hear the outcome of that today. Yeah. Nagina, you're on mute. Oh, thank you. That's happening a lot, huh? If this is in person, maybe you wouldn't have had to worry about that. <laughs> just just the, the problems of Zoom, I guess. But um, what I was saying was that part of our process is actually having uh, a private link that we have generated specifically for this program. And so as we meet with uh, different NGOs, um, we share our link with them. And once the talent applies to what we call our refugee talent community, um, we're doing a reverse match. So we're taking their resume and because we have thousands of open roles here at Pfizer uh, at all levels, we're taking the resume and we're matching it to existing roles that we have so that, uh, you know, Rahil isn't sitting there going through every single uh, role and trying to match it with the person manually. We're having the, uh, the actual automation process itself do most of that work. Um, and then one of our processes in terms of uh, how Rahil recruits and makes contact with our talent is um, she goes through the matches that are made through our program. But then furthermore, um, as another part of her role, she reaches out to every single candidate, regardless of whether there's a role for them or not, she will reach out to them and conduct a phone screening with them. Um, because that's just a promise that we have made as part of creating our talent community. And so with that said, um, I will open the floor for any questions. Uh, again, we're really looking forward to hearing your thoughts and are happy to speak about the program a bit more. Great, thank you ladies so much. Um, I'm gonna ask, it says my internet is unstable. So um, Queen, I might need you to chime in for me if I lose connection. 
Um, I think one of your questions, one of the questions has already been answered. Um, and I believe the second one as well. Um, I just had it pulled up, just had it pulled up. I think the question was um, how many individuals are you, refugees are you looking to hire in the Memphis market? So in Memphis specifically right now, we're looking to hire a cohort of five. Um, so we've identified some roles again, where um, native or fluent English skills would not necessarily be a requirement as kind of a starting point to get our foot in the door and begin this initiative. Um, but as Nagina mentioned, we have this great process also where if there are other candidates who we can match to open roles, that would absolutely be something we would love to do. Um, so hoping to continue to see this uh, grow. And <clears throat> five is a fairly large footprint for our Memphis area. We have about 100 full-time colleagues right now. Um, so from a percentage basis, um, pretty excited about being able to do that. Awesome. Um, another question, how has the program impacted Pfizer's culture? Um, and was there any training that you had to do with um, current employees to be able to welcome and integrate in the refugees? Yeah, that's a great question. I can kind of speak a little bit locally and then um, Nagina, I'm sure you have some insights more broadly. So actually tomorrow, um, I'm scheduled to attend all employee meetings at the Memphis site. And one of the topics that I'm gonna be covering is this program um, and ways that our current colleagues can help uh, our refugees uh, feel welcome and to live out our value of equity. So one of the things that I'll be kind of talking through is um, the concept that equity is not necessarily equality, right? So as Nagina has shared some of these specific initiatives that we're doing because of the extraordinary circumstances with these refugees, we wanna help colleagues understand, um, you know, the importance of this and also all of the hardships that these uh, refugees have faced coming into this situation, which may be why um, some of the hiring practices may look different um, but again, one of our core values from a Pfizer standpoint is equity. So it's really reinforcing that message of um, making Pfizer an amazing place to work for all. Um, Nagina, anything from kind of a broader Pfizer standpoint? Sure. So um, on a broader scale, we are committed to making sure every hire is matched with what we're calling a buddy. Um, and so we do have a commitment to 150 mentors and uh, the distinguishing between a mentor and a buddy is that the mentor is somebody who is committed to uh, helping that talent grow in their career, giving them guidance and allowing them to be aware of different resources and even branching out their uh, professional network. Um, and that's more of a long-term commitment, right? And so a relationship like that we're hoping would be lasting a minimum of a year. Whereas a buddy is a commitment that happens between all existing Pfizer colleague and our new hire, where the existing colleague is walking them through the processes that we have. We're hoping to match our new hires by um, either site or organization, depending on whether the role is a remote or, or an on-site role. And so once they have been matched, that existing colleague who is the buddy will be um, sharing the different uh, benefits and resources that we have at Pfizer. At Pfizer, they'll quickly learn we have a ton of acronyms. And so, for example, that one of the resources would be sharing our little Pfizer dictionary or how to access our InfoBot, where you can ask the InfoBot what this acronym stands for. Um, but then we also do have more resources such as our BT on demand in terms of uh, knowledge based articles to help guide the colleague if they have any questions on using a certain application. Um, and then there's even more when it comes to our benefits, of course. We have tons of benefits and I think it's very critical for every colleague to be aware of it. And so part of the purpose of the buddy is to make sure that that new hire is aware of everything that's offered to them. Great, great. I have, we have several questions popping up, ladies. <laughs> so uh, this next one, what advice would you give to employers in Memphis seeking to create an equitable hiring program and benefit package to attract hire and retain newly hired refugees at their company? So I can, I can speak to this a little bit and then Ali and Rafael, if you guys wanna build on it. Um, 
I remember reading somewhere early on when I was first reviewing uh, TENS guidelines and reasons to as to why companies should hire refugees. Refugees show um, very high retainment in companies that they're introduced to. And so they're committed, they're loyal, and they will strive to succeed in whatever space you put them in. And so I think looking at it from that lens and understanding that this is also a population that comes from um, a pretty traumatic background. And it's important that if we are really truly holding ourselves accountable to upholding equity, that we make sure that we're recognizing who they are as an individual first and making sure that we meet their needs, uh, especially if our companies are, our companies are able to. Um, and so that's just my take on that. And in terms of our transportation, I mean, it's, it's really just putting yourselves in their shoes, yourselves in their shoes, right? Thinking like if I was in that position where I'm coming into a country and I don't have really a penny to my name, how am I expected to even get to my job? Um, so it's like thinking of those things and really understanding that if we are able to afford it, why wouldn't we? Um, that's, that's, I think that's the take that Pfizer is, has on it. And I think that's a very important take to have. So uh, Ali and Rahil, if either of you wanted to just build on that. Um, Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would actually, the advice that I would give is for any um, any hiring manager, anyone out of Memphis or anywhere to focus on that person's transferable skills, um, on the candidate's transferable skills, uh, what they can offer, their attitude, their um, uh, their background. Uh, some of, a lot of uh, amazing candidates come in with uh, a CV that's a little bit longer than a resume. Let's not focus on the fact that it's, it just looks different than what we're used to seeing in a one to two page resume. You know, and that's a great answer. And it kind of leads to this next uh, question, something that many of us have been grappling with. Um, are you aware of any organizations helping to transfer certifications or obtain equivalent licenses in the US like CDLs? You know, we're aware of a lot of individuals come and they have, you know, excellent certifications, degrees, but they don't translate transition over in the United States with equal value. And so are there any organizations that can help um, us to help our refugee neighbors do that? That you're aware of now? Sounds like we have a job to do, you all collectively, to figure that out. Yeah. I think that's what it sounds like to me. Okay. Yeah, I think the silence answered. Yeah, I'm looking at the silence, but it's a huge, we know it's a huge issue and, and we struggle with figuring out how to do that. Maybe we start with our educational partners and figuring out how we may be able to do kind of like that trans transition of um, our articulation agreement. That may be something that we need to work on, Queen. Yeah. Our team. I I, I guess the, the one thing I can speak in terms of what I know Pfizer is doing, we do have um, our, our employee benefit where every colleague is granted $10,000 of financial assistance um, for any educational program that they pursue or any, anything educational, as long as it's uh, benefiting them personally. I used it for my master's, for example. I never would have been able to do it if it wasn't for that. And so um, that's, the, that's the only thing I could think of off the top of my head. Um, but in terms of actually evaluating their credentials and uh, making sure that our educational institutions are upholding the education that or the credentials that those candidates and that talent is coming into the country with, um, that's a piece I, I know has been a, a longstanding issue. I know it was an issue for my father when he came to the US. Um, and so I do hope that there is a solution to it. Yeah, I think that needs to be one of our strategies. Did, were you, Rahil or Ali, were you gonna say something? Did I cut you off? No. All right, these great answers you all and great questions. Keep them coming, we have a few minutes. Um, uh, next question, I understand that the initial focus was on Afghan refugees and may soon include Ukraine and Russia, but will refugees from other parts of the world be considered as well? Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. This, this program is, so um, 
the crisis that happened in Afghanistan was really what brought the refugee crisis as a whole to our attention, but this program is not explicitly for any specific type of refugee. It's open to all and any refugees. Um, yes. Great. Awesome. And we do know that you're working with Refugee Empowerment Project here as well as, well as World Relief Memphis. So. Yeah. Queen did an amazing job connecting us with both of those organizations and we're very grateful for it. Great, 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 great. All right, and here's um, Tracy Moore says, are these candidates working on work visas? So all the refugees here are here legally and able to work legally. Yes. Yes. Um, and then I have another question. What sort of pay range is there for the five positions allocated for Memphis? Yeah, um, so for the five, oh, did you want to go ahead? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, for the um, five initial positions that we've identified, these are entry-level warehouse servicer positions that have a pay rate of $20 per hour, um, as well as the very generous benefits that Nagina um, mentioned. Uh, so that would be kind of our entry-level positions that we're currently focused on. Right, and those positions, that wage is, is your baseline for every entry level position, right? Or is it specifically for this program? That's the baseline. No, nope. so that would be the same as anyone else who's doing the same type of um, work. Wow. So all of our warehouse servicer ones are currently now starting at $20 an hour. Um, also, we are offering um, sign on bonuses through June that the refugee talent will also be um, eligible for, but that's for all of our um, warehouse servicer positions, and that's $4,000. Great. Thank you. Great. Um, one more question. How do you handle language barriers? Does this create any challenge? Yeah, so um, Raheel, you can probably talk a little Absolutely. bit more about our cohort model and, and kind of what we're looking at currently. Absolutely. So the group that we actually have uh, that he interviewed today in Memphis, um, it's a group of five people. Out of those five, two of them speak um, uh, English at a proficient level, the other two more at an elementary level. So what we've been hiring them as uh, groups so they can, especially in the same team, so they can help each other with the language barriers. But to answer the question, uh, with most of the groups and cohorts, there's always been uh, at least one or two people on the same shift that do speak English uh, at a basic level or are at least proficient level. Yeah, and just one thing to add to that, Raheel. So in our meeting with all of the people experience leads this morning, um, our site in Kalamazoo, Michigan has done some pretty extensive translation work. Um, so we're also kind of learning and growing from each other um, during this process. Okay. Great. Um, lots of thank yous, ladies, in the chat. Lots of thank you for your great work. Um, can you touch on the transportation, et cetera, issue until they get settled, the services support that you provide for transportation? Yeah, that's a great question. And again, something that we actually just discussed this morning in the meeting that I've referenced several times with uh, some of our other people experience leads. Um, so we were lucky enough that uh, one of our local NGOs provided initial transportation uh, today to the site to the colleagues who are being considered. So that's something that we're actively working on now. Um, I know some of the sites have coordinated with um, transportation or taxi companies. Um, but that's, uh, again, kind of a space where we're um, learning from best practices and figuring out the most effective way to um, ensure regular transportation for these colleagues. Great. Um, one more for the chat from the Q&A and chat box, and then I have a couple too. Um, Pfizer is doing such incredible work. I'm curious if the mentoring extends to the family, especially for school-age children. So do you provide the mentoring for school-age children to that does it extend outside of just your colleagues? Does it extend into their families as well? So in terms of our mentoring, the mentoring is not specifically for colleagues. It's open to anybody outside of our, like, our organization or our company. Um, we do have colleagues who have raised their hand and offered uh, mentorship to 
students, for example, or um, young adults between the ages of 16 and 24, uh, where those are like their pivotal years for when they're looking for internships and really getting an understanding of what kind of careers they're interested in. Uh, so we do have uh, mentorship opportunities for um, young adults in that age range. And to answer the question more directly, no, it's not limited to just Pfizer colleagues. It's, it's open to anybody really, um, so long as they're interested. Great, so I'm gonna ask one more question and then I, I do wanna give Queen an opportunity to speak. Um, but I'm really interested, you all are doing such incredible work and um, all the comments just echoed how appreciative we are as a community um, for your presence and for your investment in our community. So how can we as a community support Pfizer and the work that they're doing in this space? Are there opportunities for us to participate as mentors or as, um, I don't know, as volunteers in some way? How can the community help uplift this program? So currently, because we do have a number of our own volunteers, um, which we haven't fully even leveraged or harnessed all of their power yet, um, I think Ali did mention that the program is one that we're kind of building as we go. Uh, it's very similar to literally flying a plane as it's in the air. And so I do not by any means want to tell anybody that no, we're not accepting help because I'm sure I will regret it very soon. Mm -hmm. Um, as of now, I can't think of any uh, specific opportunities for external volunteers, but I do hope that uh, when we get there, we could definitely reach out uh, and engage the community. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll continue to tell your story. Go ahead, Ali. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to echo what uh, Nagina said, and it sounds like there may be some other folks who are interested in um, seeing what they might be able to replicate in their companies. So I think it's really about how we can all benefit each other and benefit the community. So I would just say, you know, glad to stay connected. Um, I'm glad for my contact information to be sent out after this. Um, so, you know, like I said, we're, we're constantly learning and growing, and I'd love to do that locally as well, not just within Pfizer. Awesome, awesome. And we definitely will continue um, to tell your story and uplift it in that regard. And we'll stand ready to support you when you're ready for more community involvement. And I'm sure I'm speaking for just about everybody who's on this call on this webinar. Um, I do want to ask Queen to turn her camera back on. Queen, Queen also has a phenomenal story to tell. Um, and just wanted to give her an opportunity to share some insights um, that she may want to. Thank you so much, Ms. Sandra. Hi, everyone. I know everybody has been saying um, uh, my name, thanking me and all of that. And truthfully, I, I can't take any credit for any of this, but I didn't want to feel like a ghost somewhere in the background. <laughs> I just wanted to come out. This whole webinar is incredibly surreal to me. I have imagined this happening, I don't know, for the last seven years, as long as I've been at the chamber, but to see it, and to have this conversation out in the open with the community, it's beyond something I've ever imagined. And I'm so grateful that uh, Nagina and the Pfizer team um, has come into my life by some miracle that we were able to do this. I also want you to know um, this, granted that we're now talking about it, this refugee thing has been happening as long as I've been in this country and I've been here more than 30 years. So it is not a new thing. And uh, I'm grateful uh, that Nagina mentioned earlier that this, this opportunity, you know, rising tides lift all boats. So this is for every refugee that's out there, this uh, opportunity. And I'm hoping that from this webinar that you all will go out and share it with other people that weren't here and uh, Pfizer will not be the only one with this program, right? Uh, there's plenty of people who need work um, and um, the, the Memphis community is incredibly diverse. I know you can't tell, uh, but uh, there are a lot of people from uh, many, many countries that are represented that call Memphis their home. And um, it's just, yeah, so Pfizer is setting 
it's a trailblazer, but uh, there are people who have been doing the work. I want to recognize, I know they're not here today, the Refugee Empowerment Program that has an after school program um, for uh, refugee children. Uh, it's based in Binghamton. Uh, and World Relief is also doing a layman's job as um, um, organizing the refugees that are being placed in Memphis. So granted that Pfizer does not necessarily need volunteers right now, but if you have time to volunteer today, you can do that at uh, World Relief and the Refugee Empowerment Program and several other programs within the city of uh, Memphis that, that you can uh, be tapped into. And I'll be more than happy to tell you all of that. But again, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sandra, because without you and without Amity and without Ms. Bev, being open, um, this this would not have happened. So I'm super grateful to be on this team, uh, on the workforce team uh, with economic development and the chamber, all of that. It's just thank you. Thank you, everyone, for showing up and for asking all the questions and for being fully engaged. And Nagina, Rahil, and Ali, thank you. Thank you so much. So, yes. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Nadina. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying thank you for having us. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm working between two different devices because it's raining over here and my um, computer was unstable, so now I'm on my phone. So just wanted to, again, thank you all so much. And please know that we will, we're more than happy, Nadina, to send out the slides. In fact, we will request them, so yes. Um, and everyone who is in the webinar, just know that we will send them out to everyone who registered for the webinar. And they will also be posted on our website along with um, the appropriate contacts from Pfizer as you all um, let us know who we should list as the um, contact for the community. And with that, I think we've answered all the questions. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal presentation. presentation. And, yes, that's why I'm sorry. Sorry, you all, technology is not my friend today. Um, and we're going to give you all back, if there's nothing else, we can give you back 12 minutes of your afternoon to grab lunch before the day is over. And thank everyone again, all of our panelists, our presenters. I thank you all so much and all of our attendees. You all have a great day and try and stay dry. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Thank you.